All right, welcome back everyone. It's five minutes past, so we'll start this uh, discussion. Um, the way we will do this, normally you would see people in a given order. Now, obviously all of us have the people in different orders. <laughs> so I'm gonna use the, in case we need an ordering, we'll use the same order as you gave your talks, but let's see, we'll probably keep it, keep it fairly open. Um, and importantly, we invite everyone um, who has listened during the day to ask your questions using the Q&A function on your screen there to the bottom right. Um, while you think about questions, maybe we can start um, with asking you uh, speakers about your impressions of the day, whatever they might have been based on, on uh, the talks you've heard and, and your own talks and thoughts that came up. So maybe I can start with Neil to see what you're... Oh, I, I thought it was great. Really interesting day. Um, I, I was enjoying um, Melanie's talk um, when the, the point at which um, she said, uh, which didn't sound like a very interesting chemistry problem, but as we dug into it, uh, uh, we realized the interest there. And, and that was making me think about how um, I think real world applications, which I think we saw a lot of today, um, can convene a group of people around a challenge and, and open new doors. And I really liked the, the way that the theme of the talks was, um, was sort of centered around that, that it's, it's all inspired, well, I need to do this thing. And uh, when you start having to do this thing, it, it, it makes you think creatively. Um, and, and so we like playing as scientists as well. We like to sometimes just go off on, on our own directions follow our fancy, but, but it's, it's um, you know, it's that combination of a, a bit of play and a, and a bit of direction that I, I think is, shows science at its best. And, and, and I really enjoyed the, the aspects of that we saw, I think, almost across the talks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, good. Uh, Melanie, if I'm a one to you. Yeah, I I um I get, I also really enjoyed the day. I, I think um I loved uh you know Neil's talk on machine learning and sort of the the big picture uh, view of that. You know, I think I think uh you know many uh, you know many times we see the applications, but it was I, I just love to kind of hear about it. You know, from the you know from the perspective of sort of science history and um and sort of big picture and and um it was really fantastic. I also, um, you know, I thought one of the uh, one of the things I wrote down was actually at the very end when Jan was talking about um, sort of uh, breaking bonds and and degrading bonds, because I think that that's something that, you know, um, uh, chemists are always thinking about building things. Right. This is our thing. We want to make bonds. But but really, um, you know, especially as we make more and more stuff polymers and 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 you know even some of the bonds that I was talking about making today you know part of the reason people want to make them is because they're not degraded easily but as you think about the kind of pollution that's going into the environment um and how how that's going to have repercussions on on the environment I think that breaking bonds is really important so that really resonated with me as well thanks Melanie thanks and um, Arno your your feelings comments yeah, like overall, I think uh, my, my sort of like, uh, like the, the main thought I have after the day is that why am I not attending this kind of things like more often? Because as a, as a, like a junior faculty member, I, I typically like rarely exit my own like research bubble in a sense. Mm -hmm. And like today, there are like things that I'm very familiar with and people are like people presenting who I'm worked with, but then like also like things that I'm not familiar at all with. And uh, for example, like these, these talks on, on like, chemistry, I really enjoyed them, uh, partly because of, because my, my both parents are chemists. Um, but then like, I'm just like wondering that why am I not like participating in, in these sort of like things where I'm more broad than just sort of like staring at your like, uh, like inside your own research bubble kind of. So I, that, that's what sort of what my, my thought after like listening to all the talks that uh, I really liked sort of like the, the, the level of the talks such that even though I I'm like don't know much about the other things I could still follow and that's 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 really good yeah that's a good good point makes me think of an advice I got as a young PhD student you should always read the book next to the one that you intended to read 
typically don't have time to do that, but it sort of makes makes a lot of sense. Every now and then you should. So yeah, good, good. Xiao Dong, what your your feelings, comments? So I I would, I would like to share the same, same view as the the previous speakers. Uh, really, uh, I think this is a very good uh, platform for like multidisciplinary uh, field. And research so so that actually I learned a lot from the, the background of uh, history of uh, machine learning and what what was the base and uh, what you can do and also this fascinating uh, synthesis approach that uh, millennia has been doing yeah, very great to, to be able to 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 design like a molecule to, all the way to to make the functions and also the jam that uh, uh, for the chemical uh, synthesis and uh, uh, it's very important to, to think about the sustainability also to, to be able to, see to not only to make a product but also to how to recycle the product and to make use of this uh, instead of for, like put everything into the waste as a waste product. Uh, and also, like uh, a lot of machine learning part, uh, I really hope think that there there will be a lot of uh, important applications in the field of chemistry. Uh, and uh, so it's like an inspiring talk. Uh, talks uh, uh, I have learned a lot from this symposium and the lectures. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> And then we move over to Nicholas. Yes, uh, I also really enjoy the day and see the, this broad spectra of uh, various applications, which I'm not uh, uh, familiar with, and also the areas uh, in machine learning, which I'm more uh, familiar with, but it's also, also interesting to see here different thoughts. So, I mean, since I'm also interested in like the, the interdisciplinary work between, in this case, physics and machine learning, I mean, I always want to when I hear these talks, uh, to think how can how can machine learning be applied in these settings? So, if uh, uh, I would be happy to discuss uh, these issues further. And then we move over to Jan. Thanks, Niklas. I just had to turn on my audio. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think I agree with everybody that uh, it's it's really cool to have people from other disciplines to to hear the talks, to to look a little bit beyond your own horizon and to learn about new things. I think it was amazing what is possible today. Uh, just to uh, that that you have the possibility of depth per uh, depth perception with one camera or that you can measure the magnetic fields and use this really for new technologies. Also how important uh, ignorance is in the terms of research, for example. And uh, yeah, I found this really amazing to, to have this all in one big symposium. Yeah, cool, thank you. Thank you all. We have a question that came in from Jakob here. So maybe I read it up loud and then um, uh, let you think and answer as, as you wish. It's mainly directed to machine learning AI. Um, so what do you, the question is, what do you think about the role of formal verification in machine learning slash AI? Will the difficulty of verifying machine learning model, models hinder their applications uh, going forward? So I leave the word open. I, I, can, I can probably have a start on that. I think it's a fascinating question and it actually goes to the core of um, I mean, I often think, well, automatic control techniques are, are, are very similar to ML techniques, but they're ones that can typically be well verified or have things proven about them. And so sort of improved mechanisms for verification are very important for complementing sort of certification methods. Um, like typically we've done everything empirically and, you know, that, that, that that's not good enough for the sort of things that we'd like to do. Um, but there, I think there's a challenge as well because people put too much store by verification. The whole thing about the sort of the Hydra thing and, and putting deploying things in the real world, when you deploy something in the real world, actually proving behavior about it can be a weakness. So my favorite example would be is if I can guarantee that a, a driverless car is never gonna crash into another car, I can simply steal that car by putting four cars around it and driving off with it, right? Um, because I know something. So there's, there's something very interesting about humans in the real world is, is you know, the reason you don't walk out in front of a 
a real driver is you know that there's a probability they'll kill you. If you knew that the driverless car will always stop, you will walk out in front of it every time and that will cause chaos. So there's something, there's two sides to the whole verification thing and proving uh, stuff about a system like that. But I, I think it's, it's an incredibly important point and really interesting area for research. Maybe, maybe I could continue. Um, so I, I think like, I feel that the question sort of like leans a bit towards like, like the like good old fashioned AI to like AI methods with like formal reasoning and, and so on. And then like, like the kind of the opposite end is maybe what, what we, we machine learners here represent sort of like the more like machine learning community, which has been criticized for like this like cowboy attitude that we, we just come with our models and, and shoot around with. With, with the models and then we, we ride off without actually sort of making sure things actually work. Uh, and I think that is actually a bit of a problem or at least has been, uh, been, been before these things actually started to be applied and this, you still stumble upon these kind of embarrassing things that uh, things haven't actually worked out in the way they, they should have. So I think this is kind of the question is, is a very good one as something that uh, probably will be be quite topical in the future as well. Um, I don't have any solutions to provide yet, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, let's, good, good comments, good comments. Let's move on. So there are several questions coming in here. Um, one which is very much related to the title um, focusing on the uncertainty part. So what, so the, the question is wondering how you think of how do you conceptualize uncertainty? So th three different parts here. Um, can uncertainty be quantifiable in general? Um, are there different types of uncertainty that, that you can actually compare? Uh, can such an uncertain, uncertainty quantification be incorrect in some sense? Um, and if so, how do we assess that? So this is a set of really interesting and quite complex uh, uh, questions, I would say. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Try 30 seconds on it. So obviously I was advocating entropy as a measure of ignorance, and I think that's the standard measure. And uh, yes, if you do translate things to entropy, you can combine them in some way. Um, but I think that there are challenges to that. Um, I, and here's something that I'm fascinated about. If we decide that all our uncertainty quantification is based on probability and entropy, that means we need models of what is going to happen. So we need to have a description of what is going to happen. Um, but I was very taken by something um, my old mega boss at Amazon said, Jeff Bezos, when he's thinking about the future. He said, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but I can tell you what's not going to happen. And what's not going to happen is people won't want to pay more for stuff. They won't uh, want it to be slower to be delivered and they won't want less diversity of choice. And I was very taken by this because it's the opposite of what we do in probabilistic modeling. So in probabilistic modeling, we're trying to define everything we think is going to happen. And then here, what you're doing is defining what's not going to happen. And, and that's much, much more robust. Um, and I think really shows some weaknesses in a lot of the way we're doing things um, when we think about that type of prediction. And it's very easy, I think, for humans to assimilate that. Yes, we, you know, maybe we'll be flying cars, maybe we'll, you know, dogs will sprout wings or whatever in the future, but people won't be saying, please, can I pay more for this thing that I was paying less for yesterday? You know, we can accept that. And, and I find that fascinating. And I think there are domains of uncertainty quantification that try and take that perspective, very, very under-researched. So, so part of my answer is, yes, use entropy. And part of my answer is, my goodness, we seem to be missing some stuff with our dependence on probability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> let me jump in. I was thinking about in a, a bit other direction as a chemist. Uh, I was thinking if we look back in history, the past, let's say two centuries, there have been enormous changes thanks to science. So for example, the way we can communicate now, the way we can quickly travel, the way we can access food, it's all the result of scientific revolutions. On the other hand, we can also 
see it so that what we have done has resulted in all the pollution, global warming, overpopulation. So we have solved questions, but we have caused other ones. And I wonder what you think about whether we can solve the challenges that we have today without causing future problems, or is it inevitable that we, when we solve the, the questions today, uh, we will cause new problems? And maybe I just give the word first to Melanie. Um, or yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question. I. I think it's um, I think it's it's always the case, you know, that there are sort of unforeseen consequences of of anything that you do, you know, and and I mean, um, I, I don't know, my my son is um, is thirteen, and they've been doing some. Um, uh, you know, biology in school, right? So they're they're modeling what happens when you have, you know, they have all these models, uh, you know, where you can model like, okay, how many foxes and how many rabbits do you have per um, acre of land? And then you put a couple of foxes and a certain number of rabbits and, you know, they show, you, you see the sort of changes in the population and how the foxes will eat the rabbits, but then the grass grows. And then, you know, so so it I, I think, um, I, it just that's what it sort of makes me think about when when we're doing chemistry right and you say oh well this this element is really abundant so we're going to use it but then it turns out that um you know there's some issue with sustainability of getting it out of the ground and then then you solve that problem and then there's some other pro you know so so it, it, it it's always a jigsaw puzzle i feel like and and um and i think um yeah, I think that that plays into the uncertainty that you, I mean, you have to do the best you can with the with the sort of assumptions and knowledge that you have at the time in terms of pursuing, for example, sustainable, you know, chemical synthesis or chemistry or, or you know, whatever, but that ultimately um, it, it, it's going to introduce new complexities. Anyone else? <clears throat> you have some thoughts about this? Uh, Maybe I, I, I can say something uh, I completely agree. I think uh, uh, to predict the, the, the consequences, uh, it's uh, difficult, but uh, based on our knowledge, uh, I think we get more and more uh, aware of the uh, uh, impact. Uh, uh, what we are developing today will be the impact for the future. And I think as a scientist, uh, it's, uh, I think we know better and we should really take our responsibility to really to to think when we design a, a molecule or reaction or, or, or a method that what would be the impact uh, for the for our next generation the, for, for the society for the for, for the our earth and uh, I mean uh, I was thinking about the, like uh, the Nobel Prize uh, last uh, last year on, on the CRISPR uh, uh, technology. This is uh, I mean the lots of impact and this uh, and for for human being and uh, there are also risks and uh, we need to really to understand that and to be able to take the responsibility. And uh, I don't know. If the uh, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning can can help us to predict uh, what the consequences and the uh, yeah so to, to 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 be aware that what uh, our, our scientists uh, is going to do and uh, are doing. I think that that's kind of one of the dangers. I guess that was one theme of my talk. I don't think that. We can solve that with machine learning and AI, and I think it's another example of this scientism. That it's like science is great, but I, but the problem we have with it, as, as we all know, and as I think Arno was alluding to at the beginning, is we're very much in our silos, focusing on solving very very difficult problems that require a lot of effort, and and that sometimes limits our contextual horizons and and prevents us from seeing all all the possible outcomes and all the possible other ways of solving things. I think we've seen that particularly in the pandemic. I mean, I, I think actually, you know, we point the fingers at scientists, uh, so politicians, but I think some scientists' behavior has just been embarrassing in terms of going in the media and making extremely strong claims about things where there's a lot of uncertainty involved. 
And it's, it's a consequence of this sort of scientism where people, they've got this narrow field of expertise and they're right in their individual domain, but they don't understand that there's a broader context, that there's things that aren't the, a function of their particular domain that needs to be considered. And that's why I really sort of like this point about um, what's going on at Uppsala with AI for research. And also if you look back to the form original formation of the academies, there was such diversity of conversation across these things and respect for other people's opinions. And, and we need those conversations going. So I feel, Xiaodong, that almost we could get there, but I think the way we would get there is by accepting the commonalities to our fields and rediscovering those. And I think machine learning is one way of doing that because the reason it's widely deployed is because data comes up a lot and the mechanistic assumptions we're making are relatively weak. So, so I really hope it, it has this sort of convening power to get more of those conversations going where we're getting a broader contextual understanding of the type of societal problems we're trying to solve. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Machine learning and AI will probably help us to extrapolate from certain data points a model that will allow us then to predict or to, to improve something afterwards. But uh, I think what it cannot do is to bring in points uh, that, that cannot be foreseen. So the, the, the factor of serendipity that also is very important in research or what, what we chemists call maybe a chemical intuition why we should, should set up a reaction. Or um, so the, what we humans are also able to do is uh, to use the force of imagination to think beyond the the, the borders that are there, that is beyond the training set to also incorporate things that are unforeseen. Coming back to the pandemic, uh, for example, everybody knew that mutations would happen, but also nobody really included it in the model in predicting how long it's, for example, our lockdown would continue and how the whole pandemic would, uh, would evolve. So this, I think this is very important. Yes. So I also don't think that um, like uh, machine learning and like probabilistic models are like the ultimate solution to like quantify all uncertainties that there are. Since I mean, as soon as you employ a model, which you do when you employ a probabilistic models, you do make some assumptions. And if uh, uh, if these assumptions doesn't cover all uh, things that could happen, uh, I mean, even though you have a probabilistic model, you won't. Uh, uh, cover that uncertainty. So that, I think that voice will be very important with this uh, disciplinary uh, work that you always uh, um, discuss with those who, uh, who know about <laughs> different fields to sort of enhance uh, our probabilistic models to also include those effects which we couldn't foresee by just uh, looking at the data. Yeah, maybe let's take a, a question from the chat as well. Um, I read it, it's from Jakob Neuberg. Uh, is the increasing usage of fluorinated carbon molecules a potential issue for the environment? Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, I think, um, I think that um, as we've seen in the atmosphere, you know, with, um, um, you know, sort of volatile uh, fluorinated molecules as we're seeing now increasingly in the drinking water um, with some of the molecules that are used for um, manufacturing. Um, uh, you know, the molecules with fluorines in them are useful um, because, you know, Teflon pans, you, things don't stick to them. Fluorinated materials are really useful in refrigerants, for example, which is what all the CFCs are. Um, and similarly, as I said today, they're useful in, in agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals, but as we make more and more of them, they are going into the environment. And I think um, I think that, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, is, it's a pretty small amount. Agrochemicals, if you're spraying that on a field, it's actually quite a lot. So I think um, considering how to break those down, um, I think there's interesting questions of, of could you know enzymes evolve to to do that you know could bugs evolve to do that that really hasn't been observed you know to date um, but I think that, that that there's interesting questions there for sure so I mean that sort of speaks to the sort of life cycle of 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 any molecule that you make or any product that you make um, and how you know thinking about where it goes and and what what's going to happen to it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, these fluorinated molecules. You said it in the beginning. Um, they 
have no biodegradation, so they just stay in the environment. And that has become a big problem, uh, for example, with these uh, fire extinguishing foams they used um, uh, on airports, for example. So these are foams that have um, carbons, carbon chains that are polyfluorinated. And these molecules, they just accumulate in the environment. So you find them in the tissue of animals, you find them, them everywhere around, even if it's only in PPM um, amounts. And this is because they just don't degrade over time. So um, actually activating carbon fluorine bonds or to degrade these molecules is, is quite a challenge if you don't want to burn them. And some of them don't even like to get burned so well. Uh, Yeah, I fully agree. I was thinking actually about uh, <clears throat> the selective carbon fluorine bond cleaving reactions while listening to your talk, Jan, after Melanie's. It's uh, maybe a, yeah, a nice a bit of research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that has been uh, also a big topic in organic chemistry. I mean, um, to use carbon fluorine bonds to do cross coupling reaction with this. So there are other groups that are working on this quite intensively. Yeah, Thomas, do you want to jump in with some AI questions from the chat maybe? Um, yeah, let's, I think uh, our Hemin has a question. So let, let's uh, see, and then we will come back to the chat questions or the Q&A questions, sorry. So Hermin, I think you will be able to jump into picture here. Right, thank you very much, Thomas. Well, uh, when I look at uh, Neil's uh, screen, I see he has a nice uh, Mac Plus behind in his, on his shelf. So it took uh, 20 years for Apple to go from that box to, uh, to iPhone. And if you, if you try to uh, put that in perspective to, uh, in relationship to, uh, to the human evolution, so uh, uh, why are we not going as fast or how far can we get with both uh, an, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and maybe um, the uh, chemical reactions happening in our body that prevents that kind of evolution? That's really interesting. And actually, um, I keep thinking a lot about like, so our intelligence has evolved over, I mean, if you see it as part of life over billions of years, and, and like there are different, there are multiple intelligences inside us. I mean, our immune system is, you know, I, I don't know, it feels like it's as complex as our brain, you know, and there's this weird interaction between our immune system and our brain and, and all, all life forms have some kind of form of immune system. Um, and, and, yet, and you see the computer and you, you see what it's done. But so, so my first thought on it is the computer, as I said, has this enormous bandwidth and ability to communicate, but that one doesn't. That one had to have people sitting there typing into it. It wasn't even connected to the internet. So it had this super weird evolution in that the first computers had to have punch cards and had super low bandwidth communications, had no interaction with their environment. And then they've suddenly gone and they've created their own world. And now they are evolving in a sort of evolutionary way through machine learning algorithms being A-B tested on human subjects. And what I think is happening, here's the weirdest interaction, and I, I call this system zero, it's in a nod to system one and system two, like the sort of fast thinking and slow thinking. They are evolving now um, to create this sort of vast system that sucks us in, that has found like, um, so I always think it's like, um, you know, like high fructose corn syrup foods, are quite addictive for humans because I suppose the idea is that they're stimulating uh, our historical, we find fruit. I guess like if you find fruit in Sweden or the UK, then this is like amazing. And then you just eat as much of it as possible and, and your body wants you to do that. Um, and uh, so, so fructose apparently stimulates that and causes us to lay down fat. But when it's constantly on supply, it's problematic. And when you look at social media interactions, well, I think the machines have found the cognitive equivalent of high fructose corn syrup. So, so they're basically they're providing you with that personal validation about your life, which was incredibly important in small groups. Like, like if, if Arno and I had a Gaussian process meeting together and I say, that was a really great talk, you know, and he feels good. 
But now it's happening at this massive scale and we're being drawn in to provide the machine with data, which I find kind of extraordinary. So having said all that, out of the two of us, we're far more robust than the machines are. And that, that relates to everything that we've just said. So they're designed for a specific purpose and they can't handle these you know, strange situations. I mean, it's amazing when you think our brain is capable of having evolved in wherever it evolved in forests in the plains or whatever and now is doing all these things and looking at iPhones and I think that actually that is still our ability to adapt cognitively and socially to these entities is probably the limiting factor on on the speed at which technology can move so everyone says everything's moving very fast but I think fundamentally that time constant for us as people us as a culture to assimilate and work with these things is probably the limiting factor on, on, on how much they change us. So a bit of a garbled answer. I'll stop there. Anyone else want to comment? If not, let, let's uh, take another question here from the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> this one is from Nils Einar who asks the following. So almost 10 years ago, I'll try again. Almost 10 years ago, a group in California simulated a large part of the function of a mammal brain. The speed of the simulations was not too far from real time. What about AI and nerve system simulations today? Anyone who knows about the status there? I don't know that work, but I do think it's um. So now I have to go to the other side because I've got a brain here. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not a neuroscientist at all, and apologies if there's a neuroscience person in the audience. But the thing that strikes me about this this brain is the bit that we're managing to recreate with deep neural networks is this sort of object recognition part at the back, the visual cortex. Um, and and what and I I sort of think. That to me, that's the bit that we share with lizards and birds and other animals. And this is this this is this is some retro function we fitted on more recently once we became mammals. And, and everyone goes on about it, but I'm becoming increasingly fascinated by this bit. Um, and I don't know about the simulation in real time, but we can't do anything that this thing can do, as far as I can tell, in terms of flexibility and robustness of movement. I mean, that's what a gibbon is using, combined with visual system a, a little bit, but, but the visual system is, is coming in here. The optic nerve is here. It goes into these parts first before it reaches the visual cortex. And, and the ability of this sort of brainstem to control our movement and to do these extraordinary things that are done across animals. I mean, we like to think it's all this because that's like about playing chess or something or, or philosophizing. But, but really, you ask any control engineer about what that does, and, you know, you can't persuade me that we're close to simulating what the immune system is doing in real time, the, immune, the nervous system for the immune system is doing in real time. The complexity is, is just absolutely astronomical. I mean, it, so I, I don't know about that word, but I, I think it's incredibly difficult to even understand, like the, the devolution of sensing in these systems, that there's some, the, you know, motor systems, some of this work is going on in your spine and it's being devolved down to your nerve systems because you can't afford to send all signals up to your brain and back because you might want a, a rapid reaction. I mean, I just, um, it's mind blowing. You know, don't, don't tell me about solving Go. That's the funny thing, like that, that, the picture at the beginning of AlphaGo of two people around a Go board. Why are the two people? Why are the two people? It's supposed to be a person against a computer. Well, the computer can't move the pieces. And we don't have any machine that can move the pieces as elegantly as the human can. Mm. <clears throat> any other thoughts, comments? I just want to continue on, on, on Neil's comment about the go, go thing. So uh, it's actually quite strange because like people were saying that the Go is, is, is a, such a hard game that it will take, I don't know, 20 years for computers to, to master Go go and so on. And then in the end, it turns out that the harder part was grabbing the pieces. So that's, that's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, actually, and to know that, how hard that is, um, 
there's um, I think it's called incipient touch. Ken Goldberg, who's a roboticist, told me about this. When you pick up a glass and it's filled with water, you can feel when friction is about to break. So you can feel as it's slipping. I mean, that is extraordinary ability. I mean, and, and that's the sort of ability that you're using. That I think, I believe that there's a whole culture around how you pick up the pieces and clear the board um, in, in Go. I, I'm not an, an expert at all. But that type of ability to feel as friction is about to break, I think that's, so I asked Ken about it because I said, well, surely that has to be somehow devolved partially to the fingertip because the chance to send the signal all the way up into the brainstem and respond, it's just too slow. Um, and he said, yeah, no, there must be something like that going on. And, you know, we can't simulate that. So in Amazon, people were interested in building machines for picking for obvious reasons. It's extraordinarily difficult to replace the, the human in, in that task. Yeah, points to robustness again, I guess. Uh, yeah. Let's see, let's pick another one here from an anonymous asker who says, is AI close to imagining truly novel things? And it gives a reference to OpenAI's DALI model. Um, fairly recent model for those who haven't heard about it. You can just Google it, obviously. But it's um, basically a network that creates images from text captions. But again, what, what do you think about that? And there are other things um, uh, where people have used AI, or well, not people, obviously, machines um, producing music and so on and so forth. So what, what are your takes on that, that part of the technology? So, I mean, I, I, so I'll go again quickly. I feel like I'm doing too many, but I'm going to try and relate it to chemistry. So um, I, that, that network that uh, is mentioned there is this amazing thing. They've trained on like the whole internet in terms of text to get an understanding of what humans think. And then they've managed to uh, connect this with algorithms that generate images a bit like what Arno showed in his work. But then they can ask it things like uh, design a chair shaped, uh, shaped like an avocado or something. And it does create these amazing things. But that's a mind boggling large amount of data that they're using. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying about the nature of that intelligence. And I think what Melanie and Jan were talking about earlier in chemistry is like how you're managing these different reactions that can occur with a much smaller amount of data and a much smaller amount of understanding. So um, I think it's, you know, what the Dali is showing, which is incredibly impressive, is, is just how much you can do when data's go, data goes to this unimaginable scale. But I think that there's, we, and we're going to keep seeing impressive things in that domain. My feeling is, though, that there's always going to be these regions where um, the problem is complex or the data availability is small. And things like when you heard Melanie and Jan talking about chemistry, um, you know, imagining what the right thing to intervene with, they're doing it on far less data than these machines can. And I think, but it also does lead to sort of questions about what is a truly novel thing? I mean, I don't really have an idea because everything we're picking up is der derivative. I mean, I always think so Nobel prizes were mentioned. I definitely won't be winning one. But um, the, well, the funniest thing I think about the Nobel prize is, you know, when it comes to the Higgs boson, four groups have invented it at the same time. So I find that totally bizarre because why are you awarding a prize for something that was apparently obvious to the whole community? We represent it by one person. It's not, it's not null in that way. It's a community arriving at an understanding together. And that's why you get multiple groups achieving things at the same time. And I, I think that, that that's, that's why I find the magic of being human so exciting because it's those type of discussions. Again, I've gone on too long, so I'll stop. But I, but I introduced chemistry. I don't know, Melanie, what she thinks about the chemistry angle. I have a, I mean, I have a question to that. So I, and I think sort of Jan alluded to this as well. So I think one of the magical things about chemistry and, and sort of, you know, is that um, you may run a reaction and you will find something completely unexpected. You know, this is, you know, and, and, and of course, you know, part of being a successful chemist is to have the intuition to recognize that it's unexpected and to recognize that it's unexpected, but interesting, right? And so you have to kind of bin things as unexpected, but I don't care, unexpected, but really interesting, you know, et cetera. And so I guess um, kind of the flip side of this question then is, is AI going to, or, or do, is there the potential that by alert, you know, training on things we already know and expect, 
that you limit the possibilities as opposed to increasing the possibilities for you know novel things to, to, to arise. I think that's definitely happening. So that's what's going on with um, uh, embedding biases by looking at old data and training on old data and making decisions as they were made before. But you can see we can flip this around because now we can start looking at what things, are. so I think AlphaFold is really interesting in that respect, right? I, I, I'm sure it hasn't solved the whole of protein folding, but it's allowing you to get quickly to a number of things that we don't expect, and then maybe start filtering out what we, what standard things expect, and maybe start doing searches for what you're saying, Melanie, using the model the other way around. So starting to say, well, wait a second, is, is this, is the experiment we observe unlikely under our standard expectation and then get excited about that. So it's sort of almost to do it, to sort of say, well, that model's embedding something about our intuition and our data at the moment. And in science, I think this is a really interesting direction to go in, um, but it doesn't capture this, this, this observation I have. So I think that that particular case is really interesting because in AlphaFold, it's, I think it's a, a really nice example of building a computational tool by combining domain expertise with data, deploying it on an important problem, but then ending up with a new tool that will hopefully allow us to go deeper into the same questions you were just asking, do more of it in simulation perhaps. Okay, but so do you, but does it always have, I mean, I don't know much about AlphaFold specifically, but is it, does it always have to be something that you could conceive? You know, so, so I mean, is, is there always some component of, um, well, no, so, let, so another yeah. one, so in, um, in Cambridge at the moment, we're looking at quantum chemistry as an area. And as I, what I understand is going on there is because you, the Schrodinger's equation is so difficult to solve, you can't actually look at these bondings in simulation. But you can start um, building machine learning models that learn from your solutions of Schrodinger's equation and give you an approximate solution to Schrodinger's equation, right? So the nice thing about that, that is that's not, that's, that's a bit like, remember the game of life thing, that we've got to this point that we've discovered this entity exists. Now we can start trying to compute on that entity rather than trying to recompute that that entity exists each time. That's been assimilated in our knowledge. And then maybe we can build systems that allow us to better simulate um, uh, you know, the molecular bonding at the quantum level and, and allow us to do more complex, larger systems, things like that, it, I think would be exciting. Would, would one way of looking at, at what Melanie said uh, be that, that like, uh, like machine learning models might find it like easier to interpolate. So like you ha might have some like observations of what happens uh, in different cases and then like then interpolating in between these sort of known cases and coming up with maybe something more or less unexpected there. But then what might be lacking is then the, the case of like really exploring something of data or known things. Then really exploring something completely unknown outside the observed. I, I agree, Arno, and I think that that's why I was trying to emphasize this point that it's about the interaction between the human and the computer then, because the problem then you get is if the computer understands something in a certain way and is giving you some answer, you as a human normally like if I'm speaking to Melanie and she's telling me about some chemical reaction, I'm going to believe her, right? I'm not going to sort of go, okay, I doubt what you're saying about chlorine because you're an expert on fluorine. You know, I'm just going to believe her and accept that she knows that because I know who she is and, and what her background is, and we're going to move forward on that. But if a computer tells me something about a fluorine bond, how do I assimilate that? How does Melanie assimilate that? How does she weigh that against the other contextual things she knows? And, and no, because she's the one that can extend beyond and have the context and maybe the conversation with Jan that's given her an instinct that there's something new going on here. So I think there's a real challenge in identifying as you sort of say, Arno, when are you in this regime where the thing's interpolating? What is the information it's interpolating on? What is it not taking into account? And what can you do to add to it? And that's an evolve. When we have our conversations, we've evolved to do that together over hundreds of thousands of years. But when we interact with the machine, I think that's incredibly hard. And a lot of the interesting work is going to be done at that interface. Yeah, actually, one problem that you have when you do these quantum chemical calculations is that you have to be extremely careful with the interpretation of the results because the computer always gives you an answer. But you have to decide, is this, it, is this now a correct answer or is this something that is completely rubbish and you have to maybe feed the computer different data? 
So um, yeah, it's I think this communication thing is is a big issue in this in these regards. And um, another thing is that um, for years, for decades, we have uh, tried in organic chemistry to find the, the correct path of synthesizing a molecule. So you always have several consecutive steps. And we have now huge databases of reactions that have been done in the past. And uh, there have been attempts to feed this database now into a new program that then simulates the best way of getting to your target in the shortest number of steps. But it's only very few times that this has been successful. This was, of course, then a big publication somewhere, but it's nothing that can be uh, applied on a routine basis. Actually, I'm quite happy about this because otherwise I would not have the job that I'm having now. Uh, and people would not have to be in the, in the lab trying to optimize a reaction, trying to realize a new reaction that has not been done before. This would be all predictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that's think the thing that's interesting about that um, um, is also that um, I think that, um, and, and I think that's why a, a symposium and a discussion like this is really useful, because I think that there's, um, there's sort of a, a, a segment of people who want to believe that um, that machine learning and feeding these databases in to, to solve these problems and synthesis is going to solve every problem, right? And and that's um, you know that 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 um that you know and they'll write a paper that says we've solved every problem, you know. And then there's a subset of people that don't believe that there's any value to it at all, right? And so I think that um you know being able to see the um, advances and then also see the limitations in the context of this and have a discussion about it is actually really valuable because I think the truth is in between, right? I mean, you're still going to need people, right? And 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 like Neil was saying, their interactions and, and their interactions with a computer. But on the other hand, I think that there's many, many things that could be done better and faster by taking advantage of these, um, you know, increasingly exciting and and useful tools. So it's a it's a it, you know, but in chemistry, I think there's definitely many populations that are in one of those two bins. It's going to solve everything. It's terrible, and you should never do it. And I think it's a, you know, it's an interesting um, that there's relatively fewer people in between. I think that also that comes back to the, the importance of these interdisciplinary institutes and, and bringing people together around these problems to sort of get a calibrated understanding. I call that like techno solutionism versus techno skepticism and everyone either is in one camp or the other. It's like, no, there's no possibility that this could be quite useful. It's either going to save the world or it's going to, you know, it's absolutely useless. And we've got very few technologies that actually uh, have ever done either one of those. So it's kind of fascinating. But it's, it's a nice way of, I think the difficulty we have is, particularly if, you, if you're an expert in a domain, this stuff is being thrown at you, you're reading about it, you're getting the papers like Jan just said, every time it works, that's like a nature paper. And, and everyone has to run around looking after it, you know, and, and, and re trying to recreate it. And you never hear about the times that it doesn't work. So everyone feels the obligation to sort of understand this stuff. But if you're senior in your career and it hasn't been there, I mean, most of our human intuitions are based on the time we've experienced interacting with certain things, whether it's chemical interactions or whatever. And if this technology is coming in from left field, it's very, very hard for people to have a calibrated decision around it. And a lot of what we're doing in, in my team at the moment is actually working with leaders, whether that's governments, whether that's like chief execs in um, companies or whether that's scientists, just to help them develop a calibrated understanding of, no, it's somewhere in between. <laughs> It won't, it won't save the universe. It won't be useless. It's somewhere in between. I mean, there are um, several aspects in daily life where machine learning and IA, uh, AI has already been applied. And I, I've noticed now that I've been in contact uh, with uh, many uh, yeah, Swedish institutions and so on because they're all the texts are Swedish. So the Google Translator, for example, is a magnificent tool that got much better over time using this uh, AI uh, technology. So I think there are, there are many ways and niche applications where this can be actually be, be a game changer in the future, especially when it comes to communication. 
Yeah, and it's a really good example of when, where there's a lot of data and that quantity of data. So um, I was at Amazon when they started building their translation system from scratch, and I knew the guy that was doing it. And he said, look, it's just about the quantity of data. We now need to scrape the whole web, basically, and find every aligned transcript on the web in order to perform well at these things. So if your language is Swedish, you're sort of OK. But if your language is Ugandan, in uh, or you know a sort of low resource language it, it's still kind of problematic but yes it's a really nice example of something that's come uh, an enormous distance um, but th I think the problem is people don't don't get the difference say between that and then the sort of chemical reactions you're working on right so good, and that's why I'm always trying to work on this the need for data and the uncertainties to try and get people to, to see what will work and what is going to be a bit harder to do. Neil, uh, this black and white kind of perception human beings have, um, do you think AI would be better in recognizing the great shades in between? Well, interesting. <laughs> um, it's actually, there's, um, I don't know, one of my fr fr ongoing frustrations is when I built classification models with Gaussian processes, they weren't as good at that as what I'd hoped that they were going to be. Um, I, I guess it's, it's a diff, yeah, I don't know. Um, sometimes I think my main point now is I guess if we rely on them to do that, that's problematic. And actually there's a major question about how do they present their uncertainty? So if Melanie and Jan have a discussion about um, a reaction that they think is going to work, it's really interesting how do humans explain the bits that they're certain about and the bits that they're uncertain about. And they'll have a dialogue and that dialogue will often, they won't sort of say, and it's 75% likely to happen in this way. And then everyone will go, I'm combining that with my 48% and now we have the updated probability, which is like what the Bayesians would have you believe. But they may tell a narrative, oh, I think it's gonna be like this because of that. And then Melanie might say, and then Jan might say, but I've got this other experience and I'm saying it's like because of that. And, and then Melanie might say, oh no, when I said that, I didn't mean in the way you're describing now, because there's some, what they're, I think they're trying to reach is some pinch point that they agree on. So they've got this varied understanding about the broad thing and they're trying to negotiate down to the, the bits of the question that they, they agree about. So that then they can explore the bits that they don't agree about. And so even if they do express this type of thing with shades of gray, that's what I mean about the, the challenge is how do we express that? How do we bring that into the conversation in a reasonable way such that a couple of clinicians having a, a discussion about a patient can also assimilate this information into that conversation. So, I mean, like the likes of Arno, Nikos, Thomas and myself go on and on about, oh, it's so important to produce probabilities, but we never actually tell people what they do with the probabilities. <laughs> Well, actually, maybe Thomas does a bit because he does control, but because that's really about the decision and that's contextual depending on what the person's trying to do. And I think that's a major challenge. I, I would like to talk about the like, uh, when you talk about the, for machine learning, you need the data. So big data will be uh, very important in terms of chemistry and especially uh, like a scientist, we only publish the positive outcome of the data and uh, also very few data has been published. So this is like a, uh, the difference between like a, a human who have a lot of intuition because you have trained, you have done a lot of experiments and this has never been part of the data that has been uh, input, uh, like available for, for research. And uh, if we were able to collect all the data, both the successful experiments and also on mostly unsuccessful experiments would that be a much better uh, platform for for applying the uh, machine learning i don't know if melanie and yam would like to say something about that and how that is in chemistry um in terms well, of the challenges I mean, and negative cool. results I mean, it's true that uh, usually you only publish uh, the stuff that had worked. And, uh, but I also think that there is a journal of uh, failed results or uh, uh, experiments that have not worked or something like this, but nobody is basically using this. So yeah, it would certainly be a, a great 
deal of information and it would certainly help everybody to know if somebody had already tried what you are trying at the moment. And, uh, but it, it, the information would be around that uh, it doesn't work, so you don't try. Yeah? I mean, trying two times a failed experiment is not a good idea to, to start off with. Yeah? But so, I, I mean, I guess I would say two things. I, I think on the one hand, I think one of the most important things of chemical, in, or sorry, of um, sort of uh, it, intuition that, that a human has about something is actually about things that don't succeed as opposed to about things that do. So, so I, I think that that's, I mean, you know, many of those, everything that we failed at, you know, you see this in graduate students, right? You know, they'll go and do something and you'll be like, why did you do that? You know, I would never have done that because I just knew that it wouldn't work because, you know, because how did I know it? I don't know. So I feel like a lot of the things that you know won't work in some level are things that you never even would publish because you just know, but I don't know how you know, right? So I think that's one thing. I think the other thing though is um, I actually love it in my lab when someone tries something that um, someone else has tried before because usually they don't try it exactly the same way. You know, they'll, they'll um, you know, they, they might be trying to make the same moth, you know, or the same, you know, do the same reaction or whatever, but they'll do it slightly differently. And actually we've had, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I think one of the things that I found is sometimes you have to just kind of kill off a project for a while and then resurrect it when all of the people that, that used to work on it are gone. So they don't know that this is a bad project, right? And then they come back and they do it and then suddenly they get it to work because they go back and try things without the inhibitions of thinking that they're not gonna work. So, you know, it's an interesting thing because I, I feel like in some ways telling people this experiment will fail might inhibit them from trying a slight variation of that experiment that actually might be successful. So I, I don't know, I, I don't know what you think, uh, Xiaodong, but that's that's a yeah I, as I an experiment that, uh, yeah yeah now, now you talk about the reproducibility so so that uh, it's it's also important i was i was just thinking that if there is a way to collect all the data uh, now you have the electronic lab notebook so, and so 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 be able to use this as a base of knowledge to be able to uh, for the for the data mining or the for, for the machine learning that would be probably helpful to generate more uh, robust uh, uh, pathways for reactions or, 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 or design of molecules and so on. I think, again, sorry, I hate you hammering the interdisciplinary thing, but this is a conversation that's been had a lot in, in biology and computational biology. And um, that's because I think the data became sort of important, very important there sort of 25 years ago. And I think that, that most of the things I've learned is by seeing that community and how they operate. And uh, again, I, I sort of feel that that's where machine learning can help, not, not by automating this, but by actually allowing chemists to get together with computational biologists and hear what their solutions have been um, and, and what's worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. Um, because it's that sort of sharing of knowledge about how, how we do this, which, which I think is going to unlock, um, I mean, Melanie's point taken that it is actually quite good if you often repeat some stuff and, and an experiment. What does it mean that an experiment was done? I mean, even that's a little bit done by whom? <laughs> um, uh, but, but those type of resources, um, uh, I think in computational biology have been incredibly successful. And uh, I see in the chat that, um, Platz of Bjorkman um, has uh, uh, mentioned uh, open science and yeah, you know, I, I hope that somehow ML is a gateway drug to open science. <laughs> I know normally gateway drugs lead to worse things, but in this case, it's, um, it might lead to something very positive. I'm gonna gonna use this pause and and just remind us that we are getting close to to closing time here. Um, so I we we still have uh, several interesting questions, um, but again, uh, in in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand over to. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for for this wonderful day. Thank thank you, and then I'll hand over to uh, um, uh, Hemming, who will say a few cl closing words. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. I also uh, copy what he said. I thank you very much for your uh, excellent talks and stimulating discussions. Um, well, uh, when we were discussing uh, this year's 
um, Celsius Aeneas Day last year. We were not sure whether we were going to have it online or uh, on site. And with time, when during Christmas, we realized that an on site gathering would be impossible. So uh, we decided to go online. And uh, I was a little bit worried, although I didn't share my, my worry with my colleagues in the committee, that maybe the technique would not help, even, even, even when, when we would be talking about artificial intelligence, but maybe the technique doesn't get us there. But I'm, of course, very glad that things worked fine. And I'm thrilled that uh, we had uh, excellent talks and stimulating discussions. Um, normally, as I said, we have uh, Celsius in years day on site. And I hope that we, we have it 2022, next year, on site. And I hope that the foreign uh, guests uh, who couldn't come to Uppsala this year, I hope at some stage in the near future, we can host you here in Uppsala and you uh, foster more collaboration with Uppsala researchers here. Um, having said that, I have to also to thank one specific person who uh, worked behind the scenes and made uh, this day possible in many ways. The practical details were all taken care of, taken care of by uh, uh, Mrs. Corin uh, Tellenberg. Well, uh, she's, uh, she has been written to many of you, but she has organized all the practical details. Well, if you don't know how she looks like, if you look at uh, the list of participants, you see my name, but the picture is not mine. The picture is hers, actually. So that's how she looks like. Um, with that, I thank you very much once again for making uh, the day possible. Um, well, uh, take care and um, be safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much for inviting bye bye. us and hosting us, Heaven. It was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. And thanks to Kareem in particular as well.